Hello and welcome back to Linear Algebra, a video series where we talk a lot about vector spaces and the concepts in them. And in today's part 28, we will talk more about the important concept of a dimension. In particular, we will show that the dimension is conserved under bijective linear maps. In other words, the number, the integer given by the dimension, can already fix the whole vector space. However, before we go into the details there, First, I want to thank all the nice people that support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. You make it possible that I can upload more and more videos here. And as a thank you, you can download the PDF version and the quiz for this video here. Okay, then let's start the topic of today by recalling the notion dimension of a subspace U. It's very short and simple, because it's simply counting the number of elements in a given basis of U. And indeed, this is well defined for each subspace U in Rn. Moreover, we already know that Rn as a subspace has dimension n. Therefore, this will be the maximal number the dimension can have for us here. Okay, then by knowing this, I would say we are already formulating the main theorem of today. And this one will be about the conservation of the dimension under bijective linear maps. Therefore, as an assumption, we need two linear subspaces, u and v, from Rn. So we already know, both of them have well-defined dimensions. And now, of course, it could happen that both dimensions are the same. So maybe different linear subspaces, but with the same dimension now. So for example, you could think of R2 again, where we have different lines. So obviously here not the same subspace, but both have dimension 1. However, now the claim is that we can transform the one subspace into the other. So this means we find a map we can call f from u to v. However, if we know even more about this map here, we actually have an equivalence here. More precisely, the two things we need here is first it's a bijective map and second it's a linear map. Now, on the one hand, bijective means we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between u and v, and on the other hand, linear means we conserve the linear structure. There, please recall, linear structure means we have two operations, the vector addition and the scalar multiplication. And now, these operations get translated by f from u to v. However, since the map f is also bijective, we are also able to go backwards. This means the inverse map f to the power minus 1 from v to u is also a linear map. This is easy to show, but an important fact we will use a lot. Okay, now going back to the claim here, this is an equivalence. So if we find such a bijective linear map f, we can conclude that the dimensions of the two subspaces coincide. So in other words, such a bijective linear map can never change the dimension of the subspaces. So this is something you should definitely remember, the dimension and bijective linear maps are connected in this way. So you could see it like that, that the only thing that the map f does is renaming the vectors in u. So the two subspaces could look differently, but you can always translate back and forth with f. So now, from this equivalence, we can immediately conclude another important implication. And this is now what we formulate with point B. Now assume here that the one subspace U is a subset of the other one. So indeed, not like in this picture in R2 before. However, in the same way as before, we also want to include that both dimensions coincide. Hence, it means part A is applicable, which means we find such a bijective linear map. And therefore, there is no other possibility that u and v are actually the same subspace. Or to say it in other words, if you want a proper subset, you need less in the dimension. Okay, so now we have both facts here, and I would say they are very important, so please remember them for the future. Moreover, in order to understand these claims here, I would say let's prove them. So let's start writing down the proof for part A. More precisely, we will start with the direction with the implication from left to right. Hence, what we put in, what we assume, is that both subspaces have the same dimension. 
Hence, when we now write down a basis B of U and a basis C of V, then we know they have the same number of elements. So let's simply say the numbers of vectors here is given by the integer k. Okay, so now we know these vectors here lie in our subspace u and these ones in our subspace v. And then in the next step, we can easily define our map f from u to v. So what we simply do is that we send u1 to v1, u2 to v2 and so on. So formally, we simply say f of ui is equal to vi. Now of course, this does not look like a complete definition for a map, but please recall, we want a linear map. So in other words, we put in more information than just this information about k vectors. And indeed, this is enough to completely determine the map f. So first, a priori, we only know what happens to the basis vectors in u. So for example, they could be transformed like this. However, we know as a basis, it spans the whole space on the left hand side and also the whole space on the right hand side. Okay, now in order to see that the map is completely determined now, let's write it down for an arbitrary vector in U. Hence, let's call this vector simply x and then we consider f of x. Okay, and then we know x can be written as a linear combination out of the vectors from the basis. So what we find are fixed coordinates, coefficients, lambda 1, lambda 2 and so on. Indeed, we know these numbers here are uniquely given. Okay, and now for the calculation here, we know that we want f to be linear. Therefore, the linearity is exactly what we can use now. So more precisely, in the first step we can pull out the addition and then in the next step we can pull out all the scalars. And then what you should see is what remains is just a new linear combination. And you see, it's given by the images of the basis vectors. However, these we have already defined as the new basis vectors in V. Hence, what you should see is now f of x is already completely determined just by this definition here. In other words now, in general, you can just treat the left hand side here as the definition of f of x. Therefore, now there should be no doubt at all, we have to find a map from u to v. And indeed, by this definition here, we immediately know it's a linear map. Therefore, the only thing that remains to show is now that f is also bijective. In fact, we can simply show this by simply defining the inverse map. And there, maybe not so surprising, we do exactly the same thing as before. So we simply send the basis vectors in V to the basis vectors in U. So this, with the same calculation as before, gives us a new linear map and it turns out this is actually the inverse of F. Indeed, this is not hard to check, just calculate the two compositions. This means f inverse composed with f, then putting in an element x, gives us x. Moreover, the other way around as well, so f after f inverse of an element y gives us back y. Okay, and then you see, with this the proof is finished, because f is linear by construction and also bijective. There we have it, there is our bijective linear map f. Hence, the first implication from left to right is proven. Now, for the implication from right to left, we have to assume that we already have such a bijective linear map. And then, we want to show that the dimensions of u and v coincide. Indeed, what we need to use there is that bijective consists of two parts. Of course, it's simply injective and surjective together. Indeed, the split here helps us because we want to construct a basis in v. And you already know, a basis has two important ingredients. First, it's a linearly independent family, and second, it spans the whole space. Now, of course, in order to do this, we first start with a basis on the left-hand side. So let B be a basis of the U. And then you know, the goal now would be to show that a basis in V has also K elements. Hence, the only thing we have to do now is to construct a family in V. And this is not complicated at all, because we have our function f and can just apply this to all the vectors u. Hence, now we have a family with vectors in v that also has k elements. 
Okay, and now the question is, is this family linearly independent and does it span V? If we have both these things, then we have a basis in V. Now, in fact, it's not hard to show that we have these two properties exactly because we have the injectivity and the surjectivity. More precisely, we can show that if F is injective, then it sends a linearly independent set to a linearly independent set. So in other words, we know the basis here is linearly independent, therefore this new family is also linearly independent. Okay, and then the other part would be that the span of the whole family is V. And there it might not surprise you that this follows from the fact that F is subjective. There, please recall, subjectivity means we hit all the elements in V and now we can use the linearity of F again to just use linear combinations of the basis vectors. And then it immediately follows that the span of the whole family is V. Okay, and there you see, this is all what we need. We have the linear independence and this generating claim. And this is exactly the definition of a basis. And now we see the numbers of elements is the same, hence the dimension is the same. So you see, we have written down the proof of this direction as well, so we have proven the whole equivalence. Hence, the only thing missing is now part B, which is not hard at all. So there, please recall, what we want to show is that for subsets, when the dimensions coincide, the spaces already coincide. Of course, this follows immediately from the linear structure. The whole space is spanned by basis vectors. More precisely, this means when we start with a basis out of k vectors for u, we also get a basis for v. This follows immediately because we have the subset relations, so the vectors u are also elements in v. Here, please note, we already know the dimension of v and we have a linearly independent set here. In other words, it's a basis for v as well. This means each vector v in v can be written as a linear combination out of these vectors. However, then we know this is a linear combination out of vectors in u and u is also a subspace, Therefore, this is also an element in U. Therefore, the only correct conclusion we can have here is that U is equal to V. So with this, you see our proof is finished and the video for today complete. And now I hope you have learned how to deal with this abstract concept of a dimension. It will be very important in later videos, but first I would say let's get more concrete again. So let's talk about special matrices in the next video again. Therefore, I really hope that we meet there again and have a nice day. Bye.